Now the final aspect of data analysis or um, consensus analysis of our studies is to do with the use of visualizations. Uh, collecting a whole lot of statistical data and looking at all of those numbers, if we're really good at mathematics and can visualize mathematical functions and um, all the related aspects of topology and so forth with high order mathematics, all well and good. But for most people, uh, the use of visualizations can help us see the relationship between various aspects of the data. Now, the simplest of these is, of course, the graph, where we can, or even simpler, it would be a table. But then we have graphs, and we have a whole range of different types of graphs that allow us to see the relationship between various aspects of the data, whether or not it is trending up or trending down, for example, or staying constant, or cyclic, uh, being cyclical. So there can be a range of different aspects of data that we can see through the mathematical relationships between various variables um, that are then plotted on two-dimensional or three-dimensional graphs. Now, there are a range of other techniques, though, that can be utilized in relation to this. Um, one is just coming up with diagrams and showing the relationship between elements in a effective diagram. Um, and then there are, are a series of particular approaches. Um, we can, there's eight qualitative, so quantitative um, uh, messages that we can utilize in presenting data. There's time series, most often seen in graphs where one of the axes is the time. And so we see how things change over time. There's ranking where we can see things in ordered lists, as you're seeing in your Delphi studies. There's a part to the whole. Um, so looking at how things relate in terms of percentage to other parts. And we most often see that in pie graphs. There's um, deviation, where we can see how things um, are different to what is expected. And often we'll see these online graphs sometimes also bar graphs, where we see um, what was expected to happen and what has happened. Um, say what was expected to be spent in a budget and what was actually spent in the budget or spent in um, reality. Then we have uh, frequency distribution graphs, where we look at how often things occur in different um, ways and in relationship to one another. And with that, we can then look at correlations um, in terms of uh, comparison between um, two sets of, of values and whether or not there may be any relationship between those values. And then we have nominal comparisons um, where we subdivide things in particular groupings and look at how these can be compared with one another. Um, say, for example, looking at bar graphs and sales data. And then finally, we have geographical, geospatial um, uh, graphing, where we may show where certain things are occurring on a map. So where are the most um, rest restaurants, fast food restaurants in the local area? And we can then see fairly quickly that there are certain clusters or different groupings or maybe dis distances from the CBD or their relationship to major roads and other aspects of data that we can see from a geographical perspective. So these are the various formal techniques used in presenting data. And then we have a whole range of other approaches and techniques used. Um, and I've given you some examples and websites to go and have a look at these. So the first of these is around interactivity, where we can actually change values and change things and see how the visualization responds to that. So we can change the amount in a, on, a, on a graph and see how that affects the other axis. Um, so this is a way of us interrogating the data by making some changes. Uh, there's revealing trends where we can um, utilize our visualization to show various trends in the data. And you would have done that in your uh, future study. The use of animations 
particularly to show how things change over time. Um, and we can then pick up various patterns by looking at uh, the, those various um, changes. We can use metaphors to represent various aspects and see how things might relate to one another, um, particularly using size to, um, so I think in the example, we're using um, circles of different sizes to represent the number of internet connect connections or uses for particular companies and so forth. So they're, they're metaphorically representing um, populations in reality. Uh, putting the data into context can be helpful, uh, particularly for very young children who do this a lot. So for example, if we've got a, if a, um, a graph of um, the weather, we'll use pictures of suns for when it's sunny and pictures of clouds for when it's rainy um, and things of that nature. So and again, I've given you some examples where we can use uh, contextualization to help us understand the data. Um, another very effective use of, of visualizations is around saving time um, and typically looking at how things have changed over time and being able to compare various elements. Uh, and in the example I've given you, you can also use it to compare how different music trends have changed over time by listening to the little clips. Uh, they can be used to provide perspective so allowing us to see things from a different um, perspective than what we would normally see things. Um, and they can be used to explain processes, again, through animations and other elements, particularly useful in educational applications of um, data. They can help stimulate our ideas and thoughts, um, and they can present data nicely. So we want to actually explore the data. Of course, it's nicely presented and engaging and allows us to um, work with that data more as an artistic expression um, as much as a data um, analysis process. Some data can be used to tell a story and we engage with the data because we want to find out what happens with that storytelling process. Can also be um, used to allow us to have access to the raw data, particularly when it's very complex data. And we use our visualizations and graphs and so forth often to um, simplify uh, the data so that we can have, make an understanding of it. But particularly with digital systems, we can also have it set up so that we can actually go in and see the raw data behind that, because that can often be useful, particularly for complex research processes, to have an understanding of what's happening with that raw data. Particularly when we're trying to identify whether or not bias has been expressed through the visualization processes. And of course, they can be used to educate and provide an experience that assists students in learning various concepts. And the final thing to talk about is use of word clouds, which have been very popular. Um, they have their advantages and disadvantages, but they are a nice way of visualizing uh, very simply sets of data based upon the frequency of various words um, in data sets. And I've given you some tools to try and exploring and creating your own word clouds. And you can share those into Teams. And we'll discuss these various techniques and what you've um, explored with them in the tutorial.